Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ron Payne. I, uh, I'm president of the Otter Creek Audubon Society. I'd like to welcome you all back to the uh, first cabin fever lecture series we've had in several years. The, the last one we had also featured the same speaker um, <laughs> to a much smaller audience um, because that was in March 2020. 2025 people in the audience, oh. including my wife. <laughs> <laughs> It was a very good talk. You can find it online. Um, uh, just a, a couple things. Um, so uh, upcoming events this Saturday is our monthly wildlife walk at Otterview Park. I recommend not coming because of the weather forecast. <laughs> but I will be there in case anybody really wants to uh, be up there bad weather. Um, and then next month, we've got uh, Snakes of Vermont uh, presented by James Andrews back here and then on um, March 14th again back in this room we have mosquitoes suck um, <laughs> by, presented by uh, Craig Zontag um, so uh, uh, that's what we're going on um, and uh, so our speaker tonight uh, is Hank Gaysner he's a world traveling birder he's got a huge uh, life list over 7,000 birds 8,000 birds <laughs> um, and uh, this is a trip he took early in the pandemic uh, with his brother. And uh, let's uh, let's all see what. Uh, nice to be here. This is my sixth time that I've been here. Uh, always a pleasure. I guess the last three years, and when Ron called and said uh, that he'd like me to come back, I was just so happy to be in front of this group. Really, really very nice. This is a trip that I took to Columbia. Uh, as you can see, in April of 2021, it was a year into COVID. My brother, who's a uh, world-renowned bird watcher, and you'll hear more about him as I go through the talk, uh, and I decided that we would go on bird watching trips and we would try to use the local guides that had been without work for the last year and probably for the next year or two. So we're trying to support the local infrastructure of bird watching overseas by these trips that we were taking. So uh, that we did. Uh, I went with my brother Peter. My brother Peter, does anybody get Birding Magazine? You remember ABA? Uh, my brother, uh, Peter, just had a big article about him written up in uh, Birding Magazine. Uh, he's the number one ranked bird watcher in the world. And he's about to get to 10,000 species, which is a nice round number, so there'll be a lot of publicity about Peter Kasner. So I travel with my younger brother, Peter Kasner. Pe people say to me, your younger brother's seen more birds than you have. And I said, well, that's all right. It's, it's like, like a college, college professor that has a student that goes on to be, uh, you know, <laughs> like a world famous person, and that college professor feels so strongly that they had an influence on that. And I feel the same way with my brother Peter. Uh, Diego is uh, Colombia's best bird watcher, a real big tour guide. Um, the three of us spent two weeks in Colombia. We had a wonderful time, uh, needless to say. For me, travel is more than just bird watching. I've traveled all my life. I worked for McCormick and Company. I bought spices and I traveled to Madagascar and India and places all over the world. Uh, so geography, the political and the physical part of geography, cultures, what we see when we travel overseas, how the people live. You'll see some of that in this uh, presentation. Uh, the food and the crops that are grown. I was a spice buyer, so when I traveled on business, I was looking for black pepper and vanilla, other spices. The politics. In this trip, we're right along the Venezuelan border where two million Venezuelans have crossed into Colombia over the last couple of years because of the political situation, conservation efforts that are going on, and of course, birds. So we're going to talk about, I hope, all of those things in the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes. Colombia is in South America, interesting country because it has a border on the Caribbean side and a border on the Pacific side. Uh, for that reason and several others, it is the country with the largest bird list. Almost 2,000 species of birds are found in Colombia. Uh, it also has a wonderful mountain series of mountain ranges, the three Andes ranges, the eastern, the central, and the western Andes range. Uh, in the northeast is an area called the Llanos, which is very much like Florida. If you've been to Lake Okeechobee or southern Florida, you'll recognize those photographs coming up. Me Too down the lower right is in the Amazon Basin. Uh, just a wonderful country. On this trip, we're going to start out in the Llanos, number one there. We're going to go down to Me Too. We're going to go up into the eastern Andes outside of Bogota, down into the Magdalena Valley, uh, number four. And we're going to end up in Perija Mountains, which until recently have been out of bounds because there were lots of terrorist activity in that area. So some of the first bird watchers to go back. It was during COVID. It was very interesting to travel during COVID. This is in the middle of COVID. You're supposed to be home with a mask on and not talking to people. 
Uh, when we went into Columbia, lots of signs, uh, use of uh, masks is uh, obligatory. As we went into airport, we saw much better control over COVID than we saw in the United States that we left. Uh, they had all sorts of machines there to make sure that the people were identified. They disinfected all the carry-on items that you had and all the baggage so that uh, nothing would happen. Uh, so very, very impressed with that. As I mentioned, the first part is up in what we call the Llanos, or the prairie parts of uh, eastern, northeastern Colombia and Venezuela. Years ago, as a bird watcher, I wanted to go to the Llanos of Venezuela because there were a half a dozen species of birds found nowhere else in the world. I always wanted to go there, and then all of a sudden, for political reasons, you can't go there anymore. But the same habitat is in northeastern Colombia. So we went there. The specialty birds that I wanted to see were an ibis, a goose, a jacamar, a flycatcher, and a cardinal. You'll see pictures of all of those. This is what the Llanos look like. If you think of Colombia, a lot of people think of just the Andes Mountains, a lot of diverse uh, habitat. This is what the roadside looks like. Most of the agriculture is actually raising cattle, very, very big in this part of the world. Uh, it didn't take us too long going down the road to find the first of our uh, target birds, the white-bearded flycatcher just sitting along the roadside. The mass cardinal was another one. I mean, you're riding down the road in the car, and these birds are right alongside the road. It couldn't have been easier. Uh, very, very nice. Another bird that we saw on that first day as we were driving toward our first uh, overnight stay, you can see it on the fence post. I'll get a little closer. It's the burrowing owl. There are a lot of birds that are found in Colombia and in the United States. The burrowing owl, not so much one uh, found in Vermont, although the last bird slide that you'll see is one that is a Vermont bird that we saw also in Colombia. But the burrowing owl is just a really neat bird. They're found in Florida out west. How many of you have seen burrowing owls? They're just really fun. You go down the road and they're sitting on top of a, a pile of dirt or on top of a fence post. Uh, I never get tired of seeing burrowing owls. A very widespread owl, not a target bird that my brother and I would want to see to add to our list uh, because we've seen it elsewhere. Another bird that uh, at the time I didn't think would be a lifer for me or a bird new for my list uh, was the rufous-fronted thornbird, and it's named after its nest. Look at that nest. It's made out of thorns. And at the time, it was called the rufous-fronted thornbird. If you're a listing bird watcher, you know that recently there's been a lot of taxonomic changes and a lot of species have been split out from others. So just this year, the thornbird that's in Colombia, in Venezuela, has been split out to a separate species because it doesn't have a rufous front. And this one is called the plain thornbird. So at first I thought it was when I saw it, a bird I'd already seen before, but now it's a new bird for my list. This is what the Llanos look like. A lot of you have been to southern Florida. Doesn't it look like Lake Okeechobee area? Uh, just marsh, grassland, that sort of thing. Different birds, though. The Orinoco goose uh, was number three of the target birds we wanted to see, again, right alongside the road. The Jabiru stork is sort of a replacement for our wood ibis. We used to call it, or the, call it the wood ibis. It's now the wood stork uh, found in Florida. But this is a, a larger one. This, the Jabiru is almost as tall as I am. Uh, the Maguari stork, again, along the roadside. Rufescent tiger heron. Sharp-tailed ibis, that was a lifer. That was another one that we've seen. So very, very easy. Some of the unusual things that you see as you bird watch is birds doing things that you don't think they should be doing. You know what gulls and terns are. How often have you seen one sitting on a telephone wire like that? <laughs> one called the large billed tern, sitting right up on the wire. It's almost like they have the feet ready to hang on to that wire. But why they were there and what they were doing on the wire, I don't know, but it made it for an interesting picture. Also, a uh, lesser yellow-headed vulture, uh, very closely related to our turkey vulture, as you can see, but found in the open country all over South America. There's its yellow head a little bit closer up. We went to a place called Ato La Aurora, which was formerly a cattle ranch. And in Latin America, you see today a lot of these places that have been taken over by conservationists uh, turned into echo lodges where they used to be just farming and now they're uh, bringing in tourists. Of course, during COVID, we were the only people there. Peter and I were the only visitors that they'd had in a year. And probably for the next year or two, they would not have had any more visitors. Uh, so very, very disappointing for them. This was the owner of that large uh, farm. And he was telling us the different habitats and where the birds were. Uh, there was a river right outside the lodge that uh, led us to target bird number five. We wanted to see five, and within the first day, we'd seen all of them. Uh, this is the pale-headed jacamar. Again, a bird found just in that area of central Venezuela in northwestern Colombia. 
nowhere else in the world. This is again the habitat, not so spectacular, just working along the roadside. Uh, the animals there were very, very uh, not, not worried about people at all, very, very tame. Here's a deer that had come up. Because it's a conservation area and there's no shooting, the birds and the animals uh, are, are very, very nice. Uh, the bare-faced ibis, just another one of the birds. Uh, the buff-necked ibis, these were getting, uh, I guess, snuggling with each other, as you can see a little bit there, I think. Uh, the horned screamer, another uh, family of birds not found in the United States, but pretty widespread in South America. Nice horn that you can see sticking out of the top of the head of the male, uh, the horned screamer. We're going to go across the river now to part of the area where there's uh, more cattle ranching, uh, but some un interesting birds also on the other side of the river. So we get into the canoe, we get out, and there are so many cattle we don't know what to do. They're just everywhere. This is how the farmer makes his money in that part of the world. Uh, this was the uh, car that we were driving around. It looks pretty primitive, but it's uh, very open, so we could see a lot of the birds and the animals. Uh, what we were looking for here, uh, and there's Peter looking for it, uh, was this largest rodent in the world, the capybara. Uh, it can be 150 pounds. Uh, very, very big rodents, and very, very common, again, in this area where there's no shooting. If they were people that were shooting, it's probably very tasty. Uh, I don't know that it is. I'm assuming that people would eat it if they could uh, easily shoot it. This is the caracara. This is another bird that uh, used to be called in the United States the Audubon's caracara. Some of you may have bird watched as I did 30 or 40 or 50 years ago when the field guides would talk about the Audubon's caracara. And now it's called uh, the crested caracara. Uh, we can't call it Audubon's for too much longer because there's a process now within the bird watching community to rename all birds that are named off after people. So all birds like, uh, I'm just trying to think of a couple of them, but certainly uh, Audubon's Oriole uh, is a good example. Uh, Townsend's Warbler, Townsend's Solitary. Any bird named after a person in the Western Hemisphere within the next couple of years will be renamed to another name. And I hate to say that, I'm from Baltimore, but the Baltimore Oriole was named after Lord Baltimore. They're going to have to change that name. What are they going to call it? The Black-Headed Oriole? I'm sorry? The, to, the north, to the northern oriole, yeah, when they combined it. So, uh, But we're going to see a lot of name changes, unfortunately. This is the oriole blackbird. Uh, it's nice to get close to these birds and get a good picture. This is the yellow hooded blackbird. A flock seemed to be attacking us. A little different. These birds are all dark with a yellow head, whereas the other one's mainly all yellow and with a yellow head. So a little bit different yellow hooded blackbird, big flock. Double striped thick knee, sort of like our kill deer. It's just an open country breeder. Uh, this is a heron, the white necked heron, closely related to our great blue heron. Uh, scarlet ibis. Just a lot of color. When you go bird watching, it's not only, you can bird watch, as the American Birding Association says, any way you want to. You can be a backyard bird watcher. You can count hummingbirds, and you'll see that coming up in a few minutes. Uh, you can just go out and look at the beauty of the birds. Uh, and Traveling is a, certainly a way to do that. Pied lapwing and black neck still, just black and white birds, but with the long red legs that both of them have. Our guide said, I've got a surprise for you. I've got something that uh, is really going to be interesting. So he goes out in the swampy area with the long stick. He says, there's something that lives here that I want to show you. So he pokes and pokes and pokes. And then he grabs the tail of an anaconda snake and pulls it out of the swamp and gives us a very close-up look at the anaconda. They can get to be 18 to 20 feet long. I guess we were glad that this was not that big, but it was really fun to uh, discover that snake. Uh, we got all five of the birds in that part of Columbia. When my brother and I travel, we always celebrate with an ice cream snack at the end of the trip. Uh, at the end of this part of the trip, we had an ice cream snack. But in the COVID times, it's hard to get the taste of that uh, ice cream. It's just uh, much more difficult. We're going to go now to a place called Me Too. And Me Too, you can see the sign. Oops. I'm... Oh, here's Me Too. This is Colombia. Me Too is down here in southeastern Colombia in part of the Amazon basin. The Amazon basin covers a, probably half of all of South America, the eastern part of Peru and Bolivia and Ecuador, the southeastern part of Colombia, just a giant area of trop tropical rainforest. Uh, we wanted to go there because there are birds that are found in the Amazon, found nowhere else in Colombia. Uh, my brother said, uh, I'm going to Me Too. And I said, Me Too? 
I'll come with you. So this is the Me Too, Me Too trip. Uh, down we went. This is a part, most of the Amazon is accessible by boat. I mean, there are the rivers. There's the Madeira River and the Negro River and the Amazon River. You can get to most cities because they were built along uh, the rivers. This is one city that is not, so you have to fly in. It's very, very uh, by itself in the middle of nowhere. This was the hotel, quite nice. Very, very primitive part of the world since you can't get there by car or by boat. You have to fly in. There's not that many outsiders that come to this part of uh, Colombia. The bird that we wanted to see and we got a lousy photograph of was the fiery topaz hummingbird uh, that was found along a river there. I put this picture in for two reasons. Number one, just to show you what the hummingbird really looks like because it's really a spectacular hummingbird. Uh, but it's part, uh, this picture was a book by John Gould, who was an English ornithologist, uh, who not only was involved in hummingbirds, but uh, birds of Australia, birds of, the, of India, birds all over the world, as he was working for the British Museum in the 1850s. But he was also the one that worked with Charles Darwin, and it was actually him, uh, John Gould, who came up with the idea of uh, evolution. It was not Darwin himself. Darwin himself came back from the Galapagos with, let's say, Darwin's finches, and you've heard some of these stories. And when Darwin gave the birds to John Gould at the British Museum, he says, oh, I have some dark sparrows here, and I've got some chickadee-like birds, and he had no idea. It was John Gould in the museum that actually began to think, wait a minute, these finches, they're starting to look alike. Darwin didn't even know which island they'd come from. So in terms of evolution of different birds on different islands, none of that would have been known if it hadn't been for John Gould. So not only hummingbirds, but his impact on evolution, very, very important. Amazon kingfisher, there's one that's well named. Won't change the name of that one. Uh, again, in this part of the world, it was mainly the local tribes that owned all the land, and you had to get permission to get into these areas to go bird watching. Uh, this is an uh, entrance to the village, and there was a sign up that says no, no entry unless you have special permission. Uh, they didn't want outsiders in there. Wonderful just to see how these people live in the jungle, how they make their lives. Uh, you can see a fire going there. Most of the houses are off the ground, so when it rains, they don't get water in, and they don't get uh, pests and insects and things into their house as easily as if it were down on the ground level. Uh, this is the way the people dress and the people walk around. During COVID, I was surprised to see the local people on their way to the local kids on their way to school with masks on. And the reason was that the central government in Bogota realized that these people were most susceptible to diseases. These local people over hundreds of years had died because first the foreigners came in and uh, into Mexico and the Aztecs population did disappeared because of the diseases. So they were very concerned about the local people there. So they were the first ones that got the vaccinations, that got the mask in the middle of nowhere. Even the local guides, and this was the uh, mayor of the town, one of the Indian towns that we had permission from to go bird watching. He told us about what the kids do to entertain themselves. And what they do is they get two pieces of wood on a little stick. And that, that goes, when the wind blows, that goes around sort of in a windmill. And that's one of the few sort of toys that the kids have. We've got uh, in some rainy season, it was a little bit wet there, as you can see as we're walking in, but one of the areas that we wanted to go bird watching in that had birds found nowhere else was called the white sand area. And if you've seen pictures of the Amazon, you see the trees going up 200, 300 feet. In the white sand area, there's very, very little nutrient in the sand. So the trees are lower, the birds are easier to see because they're not in the top of a 200 foot tree, they're right there. So the white sand area was very good. Uh, Rusty-breasted nunlet was one of the birds there, spotted puff bird. Uh, some of the f flora that you see, I have no idea. This is a pin cushion kind of a plant. Again, on the sand, very little nutrients. One of the flora that I did identify, and uh, at McCormick, I was the buyer of vanilla. And I saw this vine on the tree, and I said to myself, that's a vanilla vine. And here in the Amazon jungle, I found a vanilla vine. And then eventually, I found a vanilla bean that was actually growing on it. So uh, that was a real surprise for me to be able to identify some of the plant life there. This one, I can't. There's a local name that uh, is sort of X-rated that I won't mention. Uh, but uh, it, at any rate, pretty flowers that we saw. Another thing that we see is uh, the way the people eat. Uh, these are, if you look closely in the this picture and even closer here. These are ants and they go across open areas by covering themselves with mud so that predators won't get them as they cross uh, open areas. 
Uh, but that's what the ants look like. The people also strip the bark off the trees. Different trees have different medicinal properties. There are a lot of drugs that we use today that have come from plants, uh, plants in the Amazon. Anybody use Arnica gel? Yep. Arnica when you have a muscle yep. hurt? Uh, Arnica, of course, is a, is a flower. So a lot of plants in the Amazon are known for their medicinal properties. Another thing in terms of culture there is the way that the people live in the jungle. They do what is called chagra, where they chop down about an acre of trees in the jungle. Now, if they didn't chop down the trees, they wouldn't have any agriculture. They wouldn't be able to grow some of the food that they need. So they have this program where they chop down a little bit of the food. Uh, they place their different crops in there. And then at the end of the time, they harvest it. And then after five or six years, it will be reforested. The forest will grow up again. So this is a very, very good way of uh, taking care of the rainforest. We saw some of that chagra activity, the people working there. Uh, they were trying to get the manioc root, which is their uh, starch that they use instead of potatoes. Uh, when they chop down the trees, there's wood there that they can use for building. So all sorts of good things. This is the manioc or cassava, again, which is uh, used for their starch. Here's a woman coming in from one of the chakras out in the middle of the jungle, bringing it back into town. My brother Peter taking a picture of her as she comes in. Also, these areas, you can grow things like uh, pineapples, uh, banana, banana plant there in the back right, just the leaves. So a lot of different crops can be grown in these small little parts of uh, cutover forest in the jungle. Uh, we went out for lunch, and the guy said, uh, here's, here's lunch. And I said to him, no, <laughs> that's not lunch. There were ants that we saw. I took a picture of them before. I don't need to see them again. He said, no, that's, that's lunch today. Uh, what they do is they mix it with the cassava together. So you've got your starch and you've got your protein, and that's lunch in the jungle. And we ate that, and it certainly wasn't any different than eating a soft-shell crab or some of the other things that maybe you've eaten, although a lot of people are turned off by soft-shell crabs. I'm from Baltimore, so I'm not. Uh, but it, it really it doesn't taste that bad. It's just the thought that you're eating a bug or an, an insect uh, that's bad. A little shop that we saw along the way, Se Vende Cerveza, means uh, beer for sale. So we stopped and got something to drink afterwards. Some of the birds that we saw there in the Amazon, the toucan, always a bird that's uh, high on everybody's list to see, smooth-billed annie, another bird that's found in the United States, but also in Colombia, swallowing puffbird, tropical kingbird. Tropical kingbird is very close to another bird that I wanted to see on this trip called the sulfury flycatcher. They're very, very similar. And I saw this, and first I said, oh, is it a sulfury flycatcher? No, a sulfury flycatcher sits in the top of palm trees and sings. And this is on a wire. It's certainly a tropical kingbird. And then I looked up into a top of a palm tree nearby, and there was a sulfury flycatcher. And he's singing away as if to say, here I am, a lifer for you, Hank. Here I am. So good night and goodbye to Amazonia. We're going to leave the Amazon now. But it was just a fantastic three days that we had there in the eastern part of Colombia. The next stop, uh, and we're going to focus now on the, the real purpose of my trip, uh, is up in the, about 14,000 feet in the central Andes, no, the eastern Andes of Colombia outside of Bogota. And I'm there to see this hummingbird. I didn't get a picture of it, but this is uh, the green bearded uh, helmet crest. And this will be number 297th hummingbird on my list. Wow. Can you imagine that? Uh, so I saw that. It was really exciting. And then we went to another place nearby that had been an ecotourism magnet where you can go and see hummingbirds and they'll feed practically right in front of you. But there was nobody there. It was during COVID. Peter and I were the only two people there. It was just fantastic. You can see the feeders set up, uh, chairs set up for the people that would come by bus from the hotels in Bogota, very close to Bogota. The blue-throated star frontlet was hummingbird number 298. It sat right there. And you say, why is it called the blue-throated star frontlet? And it's called that because when the light is just right, it reflects the blue throat. Uh, so that was one. This is the female. That was the first slide that I had at the beginning. I just thought this is just a better picture of the female star frontlet. Sword-billed hummingbird. Hummingbirds have different bills for different feeding techniques. This one feeds on upside-down flowers. It comes in from below with that long bill into a, a large flower. Uh, another hummingbird that we saw there, uh, the metal tail. Very, very short bill. Obviously, it feeds on different things than the sword-billed hummingbird. So to see 25 different species of hummingbirds in one place right in front of you is really, really wonderful. Uh, the train bearer, 
uh, great sapphire wing. The names of some of these birds are so nice. The sapphire color of the wing, giving that bird its name. The white-bellied wood star, very, very small, smaller than our ruby-throated hummingbird. Off he goes. And then we went to this place where uh, I was going to see another hummingbird, and it was the short-tailed emerald. This is the most poorly plumaged bird and hummingbird in the world. For all the colorful hummingbirds, this is a stumpy little thing with a short tail. I was so glad that it wasn't number 300. I was so glad it was number 200. So when I tell people, what is your 300th hummingbird? And I said, short-tailed emerald, they'd have gone, ugh, not so great. So we go down to this little town called Soata, down in the valley. And uh, our guide knows a couple there that have a hummingbird feeder. And the hummingbird feeder there attracts. You can see the hummingbird feeder with the red base of it there through the pathway. A bird called the chestnut-bellied hummingbird. So that was number 300. This bird is found just in a very small geographical area in northeastern Colombia. Most bird watchers haven't seen it because this area was where the terrorists were until fairly recently. There were no bird watchers going in there. And this couple that happened to set up feeders just recently is about the only place that you can go and see this very, very rare hummingbird. So that was my number 300 hummingbird. People say, who cares if it's 300? My brother's about to get to 10,000 on his life list. Who cares if it's 10,000? I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> uh, it's competition. You can be involved in athletics. You can be involved in a business and want it to be successful. In bird watching, uh, for a lot of us, it's the number of species that you've seen. Again, the countryside, the geography of Columbia, just spectacular. Some of the mountains that you see, uh, black-throated collar jay was another bird that I hadn't seen. Some of the conservation, this was a con conserved area that used to be a coffee and a, a cacao, uh, which is cocoa farm. This has been taken over to be, be a cerulean warbler preserve. The cerulean warbler that breeds in the eastern United States winters in Columbia. And this is a, a reserve of natural for uh, American Bird Conservancy that I uh, support each year. And they take over old farms, and they put bedrooms in there so the, the people can come to go bird watching. Uh, very, very nice. Again, formerly coffee in this area. This is what coffee looks like growing. There are the coffee beans, the coffee flour. I was more interested in the cacao or cocoa. Uh, coffee, after all, is not native to the Western Hemisphere. It's native to probably Saudi Arabia, that area. But cacao and vanilla are both native to the Western Hemisphere. So to see cacao in its native area growing there, this is what cacao pods look like every time you have chocolate. This is where they come from, a pod that looks like that. And what you probably don't know is that the fruit, the surrounding of the co cocoa bean, uh, is a delicious fruit just during that final maturation of the plant. So that was a real treat to have that. My brother Peter on the left, there was another ornithologist that was there studying that when, he, when she heard Peter Kastner said, oh, Peter Kastner, you're the one that discovered the new ant pitta. And uh, she got out the book, and this is a bird you can see called the Kundina Marca ant pitta, and the scientific name is Gralaria Kastneri, named after my brother. He discovered this bird, and it's named after him. Now, it will never be called Kastner's ant pitta because we're not calling the name after uh, people anymore, but Kundina Marca is the area. And if you look at the range map, if you look at the Columbia down there, very, very small area, just a tiny little one valley or so in an area that's been largely deforested for cattle farming, for coffee farming. Uh, so it's a, a wonderful project to try to keep that bird uh, alive. White-necked Jacobin hummingbird, indigo capped hummingbird. Andy and Emerald. There are just so many hummingbirds. It's just wonderful. Uh, I think there are 340 species in the world. Uh, so I've got most of them now, but there's still some that are left. This is my picture of the brown violet ear. I like to brag about my brothers, not only my brother Peter, who's got the highest bird list in the, of any bird watcher, but I have a brother named Tom, my younger brother, 10 years younger, who's a bird photographer. As a matter of fact, he leaves next week to go to Panama. Uh, in March, he's going to meet me in the Philippines to go there for bird photography. He does wonderful bird photography. And his picture of the brown violet ear, I just had to put up there. Uh, that's what a professional photographer, a very good photographer, and I like to brag about my brother Tom and his photography. Absolutely spectacular. You want to see a violet ear, uh, that's a much better picture. Speckled tanager, mine are just not that good. My camera's not that good, but just some of the birds that we saw, killbilled toucan, collared arasari in the toucan family. These are birds that feed on fruit primarily. Uh, the whooping motmot, long tail. You can see there it goes back and forth, back and forth like clockwork, sort of interesting to see. Some North American warblers. Again, these pictures are way out of uh, 
focus of the bay-breasted warbler, a lot of you have seen there. Blackburnian warbler, this is the worst picture I've ever taken, but it's such a bright colored bird uh, that I thought it was just worth putting it in there, some of the birds. When you travel by yourself and you're not on a bird tour, you just eat whatever you can. We stopped at roadside places like this. Uh, sometimes it was corn that was being cooked alongside the road and you just eat the corn, throw the cob off in the bushes. Uh, we went to this little restaurant in the middle of nowhere and had some meat grilled up for us. Sat there at the table and birds were all over that little garden. Uh, the red-crowned woodpecker was there, the carob grackle, we're very close to the Caribbean, that northeastern part of Columbia, eared dove. Uh, some of the fruit that we have there, this is my second favorite fruit in the world, the passion fruit. Very, very delicious fruit that's found primarily in tropical countries. I don't know how, how many of you have had passion fruit. Some of you had, it's just really delicious. Uh, that's what it looks like inside, sort of a slimy kind of a thing. Doesn't look very appetizing, but very delicious. The last part of the trip uh, is up to the Periha Mountains. And this is in an area between Colombia on the left and Venezuela on the right. It's actually the border. And until very recently, the terrorists were up there. And uh, no bird watchers were allowed to go. So we were some of the first bird watchers to go to this area that has a half a dozen species of birds found nowhere else in the world. You have to go to the Periha Mountains to see it. So up we went, and as we went up, we saw a lot of Venezuelan migrants coming in, Venezuelan people migrants, not bird migrants. Uh, as of today, two million Venezuelans have come across that border. So we saw uh, probably several thousand of them as we were going up the road, just these people walking with nothing, their life's belongings in a little handbag. Uh, I don't know how these people survive. I really don't. Uh, at least it's a tropical country. It's not like these migrants that come into Texas now and it's 20 degrees. At any rate, that was interesting to see. Up into the Periha Mountains, this was an eco-tourism lodge run by this couple. They had not seen visitors in a year. Peter and I were the first visitors. They were very happy to see us because it was at least some source of income. Uh, this is the wife in the, in the kitchen cooking breakfast for the Two of for Diego and Peter and myself. Very, very nice uh, fresh fruits and things we had. We eat very well when we travel. We put out some food for ourselves, but they put out food for the birds. And the birds came, including the Andean guan, a turkey-like bird. Uh, the brush finch, sort of a sparrow, like our white-throated sparrow, or tohi. A uh, very, very pretty bird. Easy to see because they come into bird feeders. Uh, the flower piercer. I really never got a good picture of a flower piercer until this trip. But the flower piercer pierces the flowers. That's, of course, where the name came from. And the black, you can see from the color. But it has these bills with points on the end. And it goes in and actually rips open the base of the flowers and feeds on the nectar that's at the base of the flower. So I was uh, happy to see that. One of the hummingbirds, very common up there, the amethyst throated uh, sun angel. This is a nice close-up picture. Sparkling violet ear. These hummingbirds are just so wonderful. They're just so colorful, except for the short-tailed uh, emerald. Uh, this part of the world, it's very, very steep slopes. Look at that sleep. There's a farm on the far side there. But if you walked out the door of that farm and you tripped and fell, pew, down you'd go. It's just unbelievable how they can make a, a living there. Uh, off in the distance were the Santa Marta Mountains. These are 14,000-foot mountains right on the Caribbean in the northeastern part of uh, Colombia, we didn't get there on this trip. I'd been there before, but it was fun to see snow-capped mountains when you're in South America like that, off in the distance. We're going down the road, and we hear a boom on the side of the car. And we get out, and this hummingbird has flown in, probably going 30 or 40 miles an hour. You know how fast hummingbirds go. Flies into the side of the car, and we picked it up. And it sat in their hands. And I took a picture, and Peter said, you know, maybe we'll just hold it for a while. And we held it for about 10 minutes, and finally it started wiggling. We rolled down the window and it flew away. And I wonder how it survived a 30 mile an hour crash with that thin bill leading the way and survived it to go on. And you see that a lot, birds here that fly into windows and you think, oh, that bird is dead. And then you let it sit on your patio for an hour or two and then all of a sudden it flies away. Often they'll get stunned and uh, that happens. So it was sort of expected. Again, just some of the beautiful countryside there in Colombia, very, very mountainous country uh, in, in most parts of it. We went to see a couple of birds found just in the high elevations, the very top of the Periha Mountains, and nowhere else in the world. Uh, one of them called the Periha Thistletail. Not very pretty to look at, but a very rare bird to get on your list. Uh, the Periha Metaltail Hummingbird. Again, not a very pretty hummingbird, but uh, very, very special in that area. 
Uh, the chat tyrant, a pretty widespread bird, but just a nice photograph of that. This is a picture that if you look carefully now, you can sort of see the Quetzal sitting there. Uh, the golden-headed Quetzal or Quetzal in the Trogan family uh, up there. This bird was a special bird for me. Everybody know the upland sandpiper down here in Vermont? I remember 30 or 40 years ago seeing them breeding in Shelburne right along Route 7 as you go down into Shelburne into the town just before the teddy bear factory, some big fields there. They used to breed there 50 years ago. I don't know of any in Vermont. I guess there's some. There used to be some down in uh, Addison County, and there's an airport, I think, up in Northeast Kingdom. That has it basically no longer here, but still pretty widespread bird in the, east, in the Midwestern part of the United States. Our bird watching guy, Diego, top bird watcher in Colombia, had never seen an upland sandpiper. It's a migrant. It winters in Argentina, breeds in North America. But during migration, it'll stop along the way. So I'm going down the road, and I said, oh, upland sandpiper. And Diego goes, what? An upland sandpiper? That would be a lifer for me. So we stopped and got this picture of an uh, upland sandpiper. So everybody can get uh, some birds that they haven't seen. The last stop, just uh, the last couple of minutes, the Eco Parque Besotes. Uh, this is an area actually in the desert, just to show you the diversity of habitats and the different birds found around that area. Different plant life, cactus, of course, were in the desert there up in the northeastern. The white whiskered spine tail, uh, again, a local bird found just in the deserts of northeastern Colombia. And finally, this bird. Does anybody know what this bird is? This was the commonest bird that we saw that day in the Parque Besotes. This was the commonest bird that we saw. We saw probably 50 or 60 of these. And you're right, it's yellow-billed cuckoo. When you see a yellow-billed cuckoo here, have you ever seen more than one or two? You never see a flock of cuckoos. That was the commonest bird. They fly, they winter in South America, they come up between the Santa Marta and the Perija Mountains to the Colombian Sea, or excuse me, the, the Caribbean Sea. And then they fly over the Caribbean Sea to Florida and then up the east coast of the United States. So these birds are flying through this valley, funneling up to their migration takeoff spot. They'll fly over the Caribbean Sea 2,000 miles nonstop to Florida or the coast of Mississippi and then on into North America. So just a wonderful sight and a very good, probably one of the best photographs actually I got of a bird that's a common uh, bird here in Vermont. So finally, the adios bird. This is not really the name for that. It's probably a Canadian or the uh, Caribbean grackle. Uh, but this is the bird that, as we went to the airport on the way to the airport, this bird seemed to be saying to us, "Goodbye, Hank and Peter. Thank you so much for coming." And of course, Peter and I had to celebrate. We took our mask off for this celebration uh, with a uh, with an ice cream treat. We had 610 species of birds in two weeks. Unbelievable. I thought I had 51 lifers, but with the new plain uh, thorn bird now, it turned out to be 52 lifers that I got on that trip. So in terms of target birds that Peter and I wanted to see, very, very successful. In terms of experiences that we had, as you can see, the foods that we ate, the people that we saw, just an incredible trip. If you have a chance to go to Columbia, I would really highly recommend it. Just a great place. So that's it, folks. Anybody have any questions on Columbia or bird watching or Brother Peter or anything? How did you find your local guide? Uh, my brother Peter does that. My brother Peter now, he works for the uh, State Department. He was worked in the consular section. And uh, after he retired, he started working for a field guide uh, of, of international bird watching tour company, the Rock Jumper. So he knows he has contacts because Rock Jumper is running tours to Columbia. So he would go to the headquarters of Rock Jumper and say, I'm Peter Kastner. I'm one of your tour guides. I'm going to Columbia. Who's the guide that you use in Columbia? Who would you recommend? So we've been very lucky on this trip to the Philippines coming up doing the same thing. We'll have the local guides and the best local guides uh, because of Peter's contacts. In the old days when I used to travel these places, when I was on company business, there were no local contacts. For most countries, there were no bird books. So I would go into Madagascar without even a bird book to identify what the birds were and having no idea where the habitats were, uh, no local bird watchers at all. It was just a completely different experience than today where you go on a trip and you are literally almost spoon-fed the birds. Uh, it's very, very much easier. But for people our age, and I look around the room and I say that most of us, there are a couple exceptions, but for most of us are our age, it's nice to have a tour where you're taken care of and the hotel is a nice, clean hotel and the food's good and you're with a group of people that have the same background that you, the same wants 
and expectations, and you can share those experiences with another group of people. I like going on tours just as much as I like these target special trips that I take with my brother Peter. They're both interesting for different reasons. But uh, just being out in nature, uh, whether it's here in Vermont, whether it's in Addison County, or whether it's in the Me Too or the Amazon of Columbia, it's just a great experience. So thank you all for coming. Yeah, go ahead. Many times. I love Costa Rica, one of my favorite places. And a friend of mine, Chip Darnstad, do you know Chip? Uh, he, he ran the, uh, I'm trying to think of the nature center that's just north of Montpelier. North, north, north something. He ran that for a long time. I gave a couple talks up there to him. When my brother Peter and I were in Columbia last spring, we were in an area, high rainforest, very, very difficult area to get into. And I see a person alongside the road, an American. I stopped and I got out and I said, I think I recognize you. He says, I'm Chip. I said, I'm Hank Kaysner. And he says, you're Hank Kaysner. You came and spoke at the North Country Audubon or whatever it's called a couple of years ago. So I've got a picture of him. And then since we've been back, I've been in touch with him. He leaves, I think, this week. He's leading a trip uh, for people from the Montpelier area or the Burlington area to go to Costa Rica on a bird watching trip. So uh, that, that, that was sort of interesting to bump into him there in the middle of the Columbia. Been an exchange to here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> so we could understand him perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> now his his driver could speak hardly any uh, English. Uh -huh. He was just as wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a real treat. Yeah. And and Costa Rica is crazy nearby. It's supposed to get to. It's got. Most of the bird families that are found in South America that aren't found in the United States, the ant birds and toucans and things like that, lots of hummingbirds. Uh, you can come back the first time. I let two of my friends, three of my friends, four of us went there, and I, just, I was the driver, so I didn't have to worry about the language of the driver because I was the driver. We saw 395 species of birds in a week on our own there. It's just it's so neat. There's so many places now, Echo Tourism Lodges in Montevideo and down in Selva uh, and different parts of uh, Costa Rica. So if you have a chance and you want to have your first neotropical or tropical bird watching experience, Costa Rica is the place to go. Yeah. Uh, do people use iBird or Merlin? Yeah, today they do. If you're on the tour, of course, you're being spoon fed this, but the guide, he's got today you can download. Uh, from Merlin, the app, the app of Cornell University, if you're going to Ecuador and you're going to be in the Pacific coast of Ecuador, you can download all the bird songs for the Pacific slope of Ecuador onto your phone. So then you're in the jungle and you can put that up and it'll identify the bird song and play the bird song, have a picture of the bird, where the bird's range is. Uh, if you're like Peter and myself and you're going to an area where you don't you want to see target birds, birds you haven't seen before, you just go into the eBird and say, I'm going to Columbia. What are the birds in Columbia that live in Columbia that I haven't seen before? You know, print out a list of where they are. A list of all the birds and where they've been seen recently in Columbia. Down to the square foot with the, with the, with the GPS. And I'm, I say square foot, I mean square meter or square something. I mean, that's a uh, very, very small bird. So it's changed completely. So you can do it by yourself and you can do it with eBird and Merlin. Or you can go on a tour and be really taken care of. And, Again, for people our age, that tour is really, the, I think, the way to go. Anybody else? Hope to see you all next year. <laughs>